Okay. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming to listen to this talk this afternoon. And thank you again to uh, Melissa for uh, making this all possible and, and inviting us to give these talks. Some of you were there for my talk a few weeks back, and I had prepared so much material for that talk. I really only had the chance to give the first half of what I was intending to, to deliver. Um, this talk was going to be the second half, but the more I thought about it, I really developed out some aspects of it that I wasn't really intending the first time. And so I want this talk today to begin with a bit of a history lesson because I like the idea of connecting the research that I'm doing to the history of uh, research that's happened in especially the Canadian Arctic. And I also wanna do a little bit of travel log by showing some of the life that we do come across on Ellesmere Island where we work in Canada. The last time I mentioned just how barren the landscape is and how helpful that is when we're looking for fossils. But uh, there, are, there are things that are alive out there and I wanted to show some of that off. So let me share the screen here and we can get started. Okay. So the title here is small contributions to a legacy of natural science research in the high Arctic. And I say small only in reference to the work that I've done uh, that, that may be considered part of this legacy. There is a, there's a profound history that, that I'm only able to make very small contributions to. And this is a story that I think begins with an American expedition, an American attempt at the North Pole uh, that set sail in uh, July of 1879. Uh, and it was a ship that was not meant for polar exploration. It was actually a military gunboat that left San Francisco uh, with a small crew, a crew of uh, 33 individuals. Um, it was a relatively big ship, 44 meters long, which is I think about 150 feet long. And the idea of this expedition under Captain George DeLong, I should mention, uh, was to use a particular northward ocean current in the Pacific uh, that's, that's known as the, the, the Kuroshio um, ocean current. It's one that's still recognized today. And use that in order to pull the ship up through the Bering Strait and, and, then, and then sort of rocket them straight to the North Pole. Uh, they were able to make their way up through the Bering Strait. Uh, if I look at their trajectory, it doesn't seem like they ever actually made use of the Kuroshio uh, uh, oceanic current. Um, here's th these are these are two um, uh, let me just admit someone here. Uh, so these are two these are two en engravings that show the the ship the the name of the ship is the USS Jeanette. Uh, this is the trajectory that they took. Each one of those glue, green or blue dots is a uh, a daily recording of of position. So so you can see that they are the the green dots are spread apart in in sort of the first two thirds of that trajectory and then much closer together where they end up closer together that is the point at which the Jeanette becomes locked up in the ice and so they are really drifting along with the ice from that point and you can see that the drift of the ice didn't take them directly north to the North Pole it sort of dr it sort of dragged them westward over northern Siberia. And unfortunately, you can tell the that the trajectory ends, right? So it's at that position, two years into this drift in the ice, that the Jeanette was crushed by the ice and the crew of 33 was dumped out onto the ice. Um, so they had three smaller ships. You can see two of them lashed to the side of the Jeanette there in the engraving uh, right back here. And they had three small ships and they divided the group up into three groups, a group of, uh, I think it was a group of, of 13, no, um, 12, 14, and eight. Uh, and those three ships then got separated. So the, the group of eight sank, unfortunately, um, and all eight of those individuals died. The groups of 12 and 14 on the other two boats landed in Northern Siberia uh, successfully. 
Uh, but one of those groups, uh, the group of 14, 12 of those individuals died. The only two that survived uh, were two that were sent ahead to move faster than the larger group in order to find a settlement. They did find a settlement and they were rescued. The other group of 12 were rescued. But out of this crew of 33, uh, on, only 14 survived. So the story of the Jeanette is a sad one um, and, 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 and a failed attempt at the North Pole, but you'll see how it, how it connects to the work that, that we're doing today. And here's just a headline from the New York Herald. And this was a big story in December of 1881 that the Jeanette, uh, and there were, you know, it was a big news story when it left, a lot of the American hopes at being the first at the North Pole, um, at least among Euro-Americans, uh, was dashed. Now, what, an interesting thing happens after the Jeanette gets crushed. Um, in 1884, <clears throat> Parts of the Jeanette wreckage are found on ice flows in the southeastern corner of Greenland. Okay, so the ship got crushed near the New Siberian Islands to the towards the top of this globe that you're seeing. And parts of the ship are then recovered years later in southeastern Greenland. So the red arrow is showing a possible path that these pieces of wreckage might have taken from the New Siberian Islands to Greenland. It was a big surprise to find them there, but what it did was suggest that there was a the possibility of a current that would allow ice to passively drift all the way from the New Siberian Islands to Greenland across the top of the Earth, across the North Pole. And it's this possible passive flow that inspired a Norwegian expedition, which becomes more relevant to our story. This is the first Norwegian Fram expedition. The Fram is the name of their ship, and it uh, took place between 1893 and 1896 under Captain Fridjof Nansen. Uh, so the Fram was inspired by the Jeanette in two ways, one of which was an access to the North Pole using this supposed polar current that the Jeanette wreckage took. And second, they looked at the Jeanette as a ship and decided that they would design a ship uh, to correct a lot of the problems with the Jeanette. Uh, so the, the Fram, unlike the Jeanette, was designed for a polar expedition. It had an unusual rounded hole so that ice couldn't get any grip on it. There weren't any sort of corners in, in the outer construction. They used an especially hard timber that they imported from uh, the United States. It was American green heartwood. They used three layers of wood. So the, at, the, at the very uh, thinnest area of the hole, the hole was still 60 to 70 centimeters thick. Uh, and they also built the stem of the bow entirely out of iron. So this is a ship that was designed for uh, the crushing uh, pressure of surrounding ice. And here's a picture of uh, the Fram uh, as it uh, leaves uh, Norway on its way first to the New Siberian Islands. So what, what they did was not head straight to the North Pole, they headed west eastward, sorry, along um, along Northern Asia to reach the New Siberian Islands. And it's at that point that they would hopefully engage in this polar current that would drag them across the North Pole. So uh, if we look at the map here in the bottom right, the red line is the path that they take out of Norway. So when the Fram leaves Norway, you can see that it heads immediately eastward and it travels along uh, Northern Asia to the point at which it reaches the area where the Jeanette <clears throat> sank. The blue line then is their, their polar attempt. This is when they allow themselves to drift along with the ice and hopefully take them north to the North Pole. Now, if you follow that blue line all the way westward, you see that it misses the North Pole, right? So that this didn't work. It didn't take them to the North Pole. And unfortunately, it takes them almost all the way back to where they started, because you can see that that westward drift took them back to Spitsbergen, which is not that far from Norway to begin with. Another line 
And then the, the I'll, I'll just mention that the yellow line is the line that the Fram takes from Spitsbergen back to Norway. The only other strange bit, or the strange bit about this map, is the green and pink lines in the center here. So this green line and this pink line. The green line represents the path taken by the captain, <clears throat> Fridjof Nansen, along with one of the crew members, Hjalmar Johansson. And these two lashed together two canoes, took a dog sled, and then headed out on the ice, just the two of them, with the canoes and with the dogs, to the North Pole without the Fram, without the ship. And this may sound courageous or maybe foolish, but it was certainly viewed at the time as a great act of betrayal against the crew, right? The captain has abandoned the crew, lets the crew go on in Arctic waters, not knowing what's going to happen to them because he has this sort of feverish goal of reaching the North Pole, no matter what it takes. So you can see that they make it further north if you follow that green path, but don't make it to the North Pole and eventually turn around and head uh, back southward. They land in Franz Josef land, that archipelago of islands uh, right here in the center. And remarkably, they meet a human in Franz Josef land. They meet another uh, Arctic explorer there. <clears throat> And you're seeing a photo taken on the day of this meeting. Uh, they met Frederick Jackson. He was a British explorer. Uh, and they meet him in Franz Josef Land, June 17th, 1896. And what is even more surprising about this encounter is the only reason that Frederick Jackson was there was because he applied to be on the Fram expedition and was rejected because he was British. So Nansen only accepted Norwegians on this expedition, but Frederick Jackson wanted to be on the Fram. He was rejected, and then he mounted his own expedition. And then these two expeditions meet one another in Franz Josef Land, and Frederick Jackson's ship becomes the way that Nansen makes his way back to Norway. So he ends up on a ship, a ship that he didn't even know he would encounter, uh, and, and this chance encounter was, was, was his fault because he rejected Frederick Jackson's application to be part of the Fram. So it's kind of a fun coincidence there. In the bottom left is another photograph, uh, which is a, a fun one from the day that Nansen and, and Hjalmar uh, leave the Fram and, and head northward on their lashed together canoes. So sort of a remarkable photograph there. So that first Fram expedition, which I've sort of explained from, from top to bottom, I mean, the details are far more uh, wonderful than that, but, but um, I, it, it, it doesn't connect directly to the work we do. But the second time the Fram goes out, uh, this one does connect to our work. The Fram completely survives that first expedition. Even though it doesn't reach the North Pole, it does a great job of weathering the crush of the ice. Uh, and so it, it, it held up as, as it was designed um, to do. The second Fram expedition is one that heads uh, in the direction of Canada. And it is a Canadian natural science expedition. Uh, this one under Cap Captain Otto Spurgerup. This is 1898 to 1902 now. And like I say, a scientific expedition. And it resulted in a lot of great natural science collecting, including vertebrate fossils that then made their way back to Norway and served as the basis of publications uh, that, that, that we would return to in our work. And, and, and those fossils uh, are some of those that we would reassess in the research that we did. Uh, the Fram was only meant to be, the second Fram expedition was only meant to be a three-year expedition and became a four-year expedition because the third winter was cold enough that the Fram wasn't ever released from the ice. So they spent a, a winter and then an entire year leading up to the next winter frozen in the ice and didn't make it out until the, the fourth year. Uh, they were able to get out of the ice and return a year late after everybody presumed that the Fram was lost and the entire crew was lost. So I'm sure it was a surprise to have them uh, back home. But uh, again, a, a successful trip in the sense 
that not only was there a great collecting happen, happening, a lot of great science came from it, and the Fram survived this expedition just as it, as it did the first. Uh, at the bottom there, you see uh, the Fram in a uh, fjord, a glacier carved valley uh, uh, um, of, of Ellesmere Island, and it's actually a fjord, the beaches of which we would do collecting in some of our recent expeditions. So it's sort of fun to be in the same place and, and, and imagine the, the Fram uh, sitting out in the fjord locked up in the ice. I showed a photo uh, or a slide very similar to this in the previous talk, and it, and it is just meant to compare what our crew looks like, what our gear looks like, what our uh, transportation looks like compared to what it looked like on the second Fram expedition. And what really connects these two expeditions to one another is that our first time to Ellesmere Island in 1999 was the very first uh, uh, collecting trip, scientific trip, that collected vertebrate fossils in, in this part of Arctic Canada. So, so vertebrate fossils were collected on the second Fram expedition, and, and the very next time this would happen uh, on these islands was the work that we would do almost 100 years later. So, so we really are following up directly on the work of the, of the second Fram expedition. Have a much easier time of it with the technology of our gear and the technology of our transportation, even though there's plenty of heart-stopping moments for us when these, when these planes take off right over the water or have these bumpy landings on the, on the Arctic tundra. Uh, we have we have a much easier and better time of it than did uh, those a hundred years past, and and hence the many more smiles on the the crew at the bottom than than at the top. And just before moving into the work that that I've been a part of, I just wanted to mention that the Fram is available for touring. There is a museum today in Norway that has been built around the Fram. So that's the Fram that you're seeing uh, in a recent photograph on the top right. You can see the, what the museum looks like on the left, but, but you can visit a museum that is entirely about the Fram and even have the ability to walk the decks of the Fram. So talk about a ship that has survived so much and, and survives all the way through to the present day. And this is in, this is in Oslo, Norway. So it, difficult to get to, especially nowadays, but um, but it, 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 uh, it's an exciting thing to see for sure. Okay, so now moving into the present and talking about our expeditions of the last, I suppose, 21 years now. Um, we don't go every summer, but, but every few summers we'll, we'll send a crew out. Um, all of, or not all of, but most of our work has been centered on Ellesmere Island, and this is a photograph of Ellesmere Island. One of the things that I mentioned in my previous talk is that what makes these Canadian Arctic islands so wonderful to work as a paleontologist, as a geologist, is that um, those things that tend to cover rocks in places like Pennsylvania don't cover the rocks here. So in Pennsylvania, we're constantly running up against uh, vegetation, which is even worse in the summer than the rest of the year, which covers rock. Uh, and along with it, soil that covers rock, but also civilization, right? People, people like to pave over rocks and cover them with sidewalks and buildings and all these sorts of things that prevent uh, our ability to do the work. So when you go to a place like the Canadian Arctic, which really qualifies uh, as, as a desert type landscape, um, the, the dryness and the coldness makes for very little life that that would uh, cover up the rocks. So just a great photo of, of um, our one of our crews. I think this is 2000 and actually I know that this is 2006 at one of our productive localities. But I just love that from the top from the bottom to top of this image, it is just all rock. So it is a uh, heaven for a geologist like myself. And here's another image um, of just a very barren looking rocky landscape. These are, these are uh, talus slopes, so the entire slope's covered with um, loose blocks of rock. But if you look in the bottom left corner here, you see some um, purple flowers. They may not immediately look like flowers, but those little purple spots of color 
um, are a type of Arctic flower called the uh, called a saxifrage. So I wanted to show you those and other instances of life forms that we do encounter when we're working on Ellesmere Island. So I hope it can bring a little bit of life to what otherwise looks like a very barren landscape. And I've done some work taking photos from our expeditions and doing the work to put at least common names on them. Um, so this is, and I'll, I'll just very quickly go through these, but this is Arctic cotton grass. Arctic willow, these are, the, these, are uh, these actually qualify um, as trees along with the kinds of willow trees that you find uh, down here in the, in the middle Atlantic region of North America. Uh, and, and so these are referred to um, as, as the tallest trees uh, of, um, of this, this part of Ellesmere Island. And, and you, could, you could step on them without thinking twice about it. So not very tall trees for sure. Arctic club moss, which um, has this sort of beautiful color to the, to the fruiting bodies here. Arctic catch fly, another really pretty purple flower. Polar campion. Arctic mountain heather. There's the flower that you saw in that uh, previous photograph. And, and that was Neil Shubin and Andrew Gillis, um, who I should have identified in that previous photo. But this is Purple Mountain Saxifrage. Sulfur buttercup, a bit of yellow in these uh, uh, dingy landscapes. And some evidence of animals as well. This this invertebrate skeleton. This is a molt of a marine isopod that we we find a lot of these along the the shorelines of these uh, glacial carved valleys. And you can see some of the saxifrage in the in the background. Good camouflage here, but this is a this is a bird here, right in the center, a white rumped sandpiper. This is its head here, dark eye and beak. I hope you can make that out. See some of the Arctic willow behind it. It gives you a sense of the scale. It's the it's the 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 willow that's small, not that the sandpiper is big. Here's some caribou. Um, so you can see two adults and two juvenile and and a a, a shed antler. Here's a nest with eggs, and this is just on the ground, right? There aren't there aren't tall trees to put nests into. So these are um, the eggs of what I believe to be a, a bird called rock ptarmigan. And here's a muskox skeleton. I was just flipping through photos from expeditions and didn't find any photos of live musk, musk oxen, although we do encounter them as well. Um, I, we would wake up in mornings and have musk ox in camp and you know you try not to make any sudden movements. They're not necessarily aggressive, but but they're big animals, and you know big animals can do damage. But kind of fun to see these uh, sun bleached skeletons. Okay, so let's let's now finally uh, <clears throat> talk a little bit about uh, some of the projects that that I've done that have come out of the Arctic field work. This first project uh, resulted in a paper here, a new large bodied species of Bothriolepis from group Antiarchy from the Upper Devonian of Ellesmere Island, Nunavut, Canada. The Upper Devonian period, um, it, the rocks that we work are about 375 to 360 million years old. So this is over 100 million years before the origin of dinosaurs to give you some context. This is, this is back at a time when nearly all vertebrates had fins and were aquatic. And the two projects that I want to talk about here briefly uh, are both on members of this group, Antiarchy. And Antiarchy are aquatic vertebrates. They're freshwater uh, vertebrates in, in the two instances that I'll show. And they ha are armored, which is one of the cool things about Antiarchs. Their head, their trunk, and their pectoral appendages are all encased in a skeletal armor. So this first paper here uh, described a new species of Bothriolepis, one of these antiarchs, and it addressed these two questions. First, 
is the shape of the head in this new gigantic Bothriolepis from Ellesmere Island, predictable by the growth of the best known Canadian Bothriolepis, Bothriolepis canadensis. And in other words, is the shape that we're seeing in the skull of this new animal a product of its enormous size? So if you took Canadian Bothriolepis and, and continue their growth trajectory up to these enormous sizes, is the shape predictable from that type of extrapolation? Or is the shape really unique, even when we consider the other known Canadian Bothriolepis? And then the second question is, how does a large-bodied, bottom-feeding Bothriolepis overcome the force of buoyancy? The more volume, the greater the force of buoyancy. And so when bodies get big, there is a greater force pushing those big underwater bodies up to the surface. Now, Bothriolepis as a group is a, is a very flat bottom and ventral mouthed group, meaning the mouth is on the bottom of the skull. And we presume these animals to be bottom feeders like modern day catfish. So when bodies get big, what might be in place to keep those bodies down? That's one of the things that we investigated in this new animal. Before getting into um, <clears throat> the new species, I, I want to uh, continue with this uh, um, desire to connect our work to the past. So the geologist uh, that was on the second Fram expedition. His name was Per Shai, and he was the one who did the fossil collecting. So all of the Ellesmere Island vertebrate fossils that were collected on the second Fram expedition were collected by Per Shai, but he wasn't the one to eventually describe them and publish them because Per Shai wasn't a paleontologist. So Johann Kier was the one who actually took Shai's fossils and wrote them up for publication. And the eventual publication came in 1915. What you're seeing across the top are four fossils that were figured in that Kier 1915 publication. And they are all parts of the trunk and pectoral appendage armor of an antiarch. They were all assigned by Kier to the species Bothriolepis cf hydrophila. Uh, they're all of a similar size category, and so that's why he deemed them all to be belonging to a single species, and they were the closest approximation to the species known as Bothriolepis hydrophila. But one of the things that he put into the name, the CF, uh, makes it, it stands for compares favorably with. So he wasn't he wasn't making a strong assignment here. He was just saying, hey, the closest approximate species here is Bothriolepis hydrophila. So fast forward 100 years, we came back to these, to these uh, fossils that were collected on that Fram expedition and, and thought of them in light of all the collecting that we had done. So we've been collecting there since 1999. This publication came out in 2016. So we had uh, greatly expanded our understanding of uh, the context within which these were collected. And what we found was that there, there really isn't anything in these fossils to place them into a species or really even to place them into a grouping like Bothriolepis. So what we did in our paper in the Bothriolepis, in the new uh, large bodied Bothriolepis paper is to reassign these to the very general group Antiarchy SP Indit, which just means that we can, we can see that they're Antiarchs. No other kinds of vertebrates have these kinds of plates. They're antiarchs, but the species remains indetermined or indeterminate. So that's what SP indet uh, makes reference to. So a little bit of taxonomic work on these on these old fossils. <clears throat> so here um, again, sort of using the the uh, this sort of generalized depiction of of a an antiarch here in the bottom left, and highlighting the parts of the skull that are represented in the new fossils. Um, what you're seeing here are four fossils that, that we collected that don't necessarily belong to the same individual, to the same skull, but represent four elements of the head skeleton or of the skull. So if we were to put an entire skull together and look at it in dorsal view, it's the same way we're sort of looking down upon this skull of this, this illustrated individual. 
uh, we would have a skull that has this type of shape to it in dorsal view. This is this is rostral end here, or the, the tip of the snout. This is the back end of the skull. This common opening is where the eyes and the nostrils would, would peek out of the skull. And what we've got represented here are these elements, the premedian here, the lateral element, the nuchal element, and then this element here, which is the, the right paranuchal marginal. <clears throat> Now, Bothriolepis, uh, as a group, tends not to get very large. Uh, most Bothriolepis, um, the entire body is, is probably uh, about a half meter or less. Um, but what you can tell from the scale bar on these fossils, that's a scale bar of five centimeters, this is a much bigger individual than the majority of Bothriolepis that had been discovered. And after our descriptive work on this animal, uh, we recognize that this is actually now the largest known in the entire group, Antiarchy. And so we gave it this fun name, Bothriolepis rex, the same rex that's in the name Tyrannosaurus rex, right? Rex meaning king. So we're using the name here, king of Bothriolepis or Bothriolepis rex. And there is in Bothriolepis naming, Bothriolepis taxonomy, there has been sort of a history of one-upmanship. And, and to highlight that, other large-bodied Bothriolepis species are known by the names Bothriolepis giganteus. There's a Bothriolepis maxima. So there's already these, these fun, big-bodied names out there. And so we, we felt like we needed to trump them all by going with, with sort of... Uh, the, the same one used by Tyrannosaurus rex. So this is Bothriolepis rex. At the top right there, you see uh, a, a drawing that accompanied the uh, press release that, that uh, accompanied the original publication of the manuscript. And we had a bit of fun. We had an artist illustrate it and then, and then demonstrate its size by putting it next to Tyrannosaurus rex. So that's what that inset image there. So it's Bothriolepis rex, Tyrannosaurus rex, and then a human to get, so you can get a sense of the body sizes. So big Bothriolepis. I mentioned that one of the questions we had was, um, what about uh, the shape of the skull? So if we look at the, again, dorsal view skull uh, in the bottom right, there's Bothriolepis rex at the top left. Um, and we're comparing its shape to some of these other species. So at B, we have Bothriolepis uh, gigantea, I mentioned earlier. Bothriolepis maxima is in the, the bottom left. And then the best known Bothriolepis from Canada is Bothriolepis canadensis in the bottom right. Now, canadensis is known from so many specimens that we, that we can really illustrate the growth trend of a Bothriolepis using the canadensis material. And so what we did was we looked at, at um, characteristics uh, that, uh, that, that grow together and, and, and um, highlight particular growth relationships that we can compare our material to in Bothriolepis canadensis to ask this question, does Bothriolepis, does the skull of Bothriolepis rex have a shape that we could anticipate if we simply continue the growth of this other well-known Canadian Bothriolepis? So that is what is, that what, what we're trying to show in the graphs that you see to the top right. And so to not to get into too many details just because we don't have too much time, all of the open squares represent data that we collected from Bothriolepis canadensis, the very well-known species, and the line then represents their growth trajectory when comparing the growth of two particular features relative to one another. So if you look at the graph of C, on the left we have, um, uh, on logarithmic axes, the width of the orbital fenestra, the opening for the eyes, and on the x-axis we have the width of the head shield. And so we can look at how those two, uh, those two dimensions grow relative to one another. We can, we can draw up that relationship as a linear relationship. Then we can plot Bothriolepis rex data onto that growth trend and see whether it, whether it fits the canadensis data or whether it does not. And what we found when we did this by comparing different growth characteristics of the other Canadian Bothriolepis to the shape of our skulls, we found that Bothriolepis rex has a very 
differently shaped skull than even a canadensis were it to grow to the size of a rex. And all of this just helped us to build an argument that we're dealing with a new species here and not simply a Bothriolepis canadensis that had, grow, that, had, that had grown up to a very advanced age. So it does have a very uniquely shaped skull in addition to having a very large skull along with a large body. Now, one other thing that we wanted to investigate were um, how do you keep a big body down, right? With, with greater volume, greater buoyancy, how do you keep a, a bottom dweller on the bottom? So one of the things we did was look at the microstructural anatomy of the armor in the skeleton. And what we found is that not only are the skeletal plates thicker than we would anticipate for an animal of this size, if we, again, if we were to grow up a canadensis to this size, the rex plates are much thicker than the canadensis plates would be, but they are also much denser. So if we compare the microstructural anatomy of a trunk plate in Bothriolepis rex here, viewed in cross section, to a similar plate in Bothriolepis canadensis, as you can see on the left, the canadensis plate is a much higher porosity type uh, skeletal organ than is Bothriolepis rex. So rex plates are especially thick, but they're also especially compact or especially dense. They're packing a lot of bone into these plates and all of that helps to increase the, the mass and by increasing mass, we're helping to keep that animal down. So, so again, it seems to be possible that, that what we're looking at here is an adaptation to keep a big, bodied, uh, a big body down when the forces of buoyancy uh, are, are trying to push it up to the surface. So thick plates, but also dense plates. And another reason to have thick, dense plates is if there are big predators in the same water as you. And so one of the things that we find along with Bothriolepis rex on the same bedding planes uh, is evidence of very large predators. So the five specimens that you see to the left are all large teeth of uh, sarcoterygian, lobe-finned predators uh, that were living alongside Bothriolepis rex. And then a very large scale there uh, on the right. So that's another good reason to be to be heavily armored uh, when you're swimming around with these uh, predators with enormous teeth. So in the last few minutes, I'll just talk briefly about um, another Antioch project from Ellesmere Island. Here's another new species that we uh, described. This one, not a Bothriolepis, but an Asterolepis, and we named it Asterolepis alticristata. A uh, new species from the Upper Devonian, Franian stage of Nunavut, Canada, a report on the Antioch diversity of the Fram Formation. One of the objectives here was to determine how many species of Asterolepis were present at this particular field locality, NV2K17, which just stands for Nunavut year 2000 was when it was discovered, and it was the 17th site discovered that year. Um, we also wanted to document the Antioch diversity throughout the late Devonian Fram formation of Arctic Canada. One more connection back to the Norwegian expedition, right? The rock formation within which we work is named the Fram formation after the ship that the Norwegians took to Ellesmere Island. So we didn't name it that. That's a name that has been around for over 50 years, but, but another kind of fun connection back to the, the history. So I'll just show some fossils here, um, again, highlighting on the illustration where, where these elements are from on the body. Asterolepis alticristata is the new species, and the name uh, very explicitly means tall crest, and that's because it has this big sailback type crest along its dorsal midline on the anterior median dorsal element. I think the best way to see this is by looking at the um, this part B here. So this is the arch of the back here. We're looking at it in a cranial view. If we are looking straight along head to tail, this here reaching up is the depth of this enormous crest that rises up off the anterior median dorsal element. It's a, it's a remarkable feature for Asterolepis. No other Asterolepis has such a thing. 
And so that's, that's, that's when you name a species for a feature, when it has something as remarkable as this. And that's how it earned this name, Alti Cristata. There's a second species that we recognized, uh, an uncrested form that is not only smaller, but has a different ornamental pattern on the surface of the bones. And also, like I say, doesn't have that deep crest. Uh, we recognize these elements to belong to a previously named species, this one, Asterolepis radiata. It's, that name comes from a, a radiating pattern of ornament uh, on each of the elements. I think you can see a little bit of that here on this AMD and even on this PMD, anterior median dorsal, posterior median dorsal. But you can see these kind of radiating lines of tubercles. That's how it got its name. That's how we were able to recognize this as Asterolepis radiata. Now the challenge came uh, because so much of the Asterolepis material at the 17 site is isolated. You find isolated plates, a paranuchal marginal here, a lateral here, a premedian here, a nuchal here, a mixolateral here, and so on. So each time we find a plate, we would love to be able to assign it to a particular species. We know of two very distinct species, Alticristata and Radiata, but maybe there are more. But even with the understanding of the two, if we pick up a single nuchal, can we put it into Alticristata or to Radiata if that nuchal is the only part that we have, the only isolated part that we know of that individual? Well, that becomes a very difficult thing. It's, it's a whole process. I won't get into too much of the details of it. Um, uh, could, if you're curious, come back to me and we can talk about this all afternoon. But um, I just wanted to show a little bit of the work that we did to sort of quantify shape of these nuchal elements. Uh, we had 24 of these nuchals that were unassignable. And so we did a principal component analysis to look for the sources of variation in the shape of those nuchals and to, 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 to determine whether or not these clustered out into two groups that might be suggestive of two separate species. But however we came at this, we would get a very messy spread of data that really didn't help us place them into one species or the other. So that it, it remains difficult work, but whenever we have material that we can't assign, we can still write it up, we can still publish it. It just ends up uh, with a very um, sort of uh, non-specific uh, uh, taxonomic assignment, which is okay. So this paper included not only Antioch material from 17, but Antioch fossils from throughout the Fram formation. This site 17 is Fram formation, but Fram formation outcrops all over the place. So wherever we went, we would be picking up Antioch fossils. And this paper is where we did the work to describe all of these fossils and assign them taxonomically as specifically as we could. And very rarely could we get it down to species. You can see in the figure caption here, this is a figure from the paper, um, that the, the nuchal that you see at A can only be referred to astero, Asterolepidoidei sp indent, right? So that's an enormous clade uh, that, that has many, many species within it. And all we can say is that the anatomy here suggests that it belongs to that clade, but the species is unknown. And you'll see that throughout. Asterolepis sp indent, Bothriolepis sp indent, Bothriolepididae sp indent, and so on. So this, I, I, I just wanted to include a figure like this to demonstrate that even if you can't know specifically what your fossil belongs to, what species is actually represented, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't describe it and get it published because this can be helpful in, in informing the community about the material that does exist. And it could be a puzzle piece that fits into a bigger puzzle that we don't yet have all the pieces for, but one day we may. So we'll stop there. And again, um, uh, similar acknowledgements to my previous talk, but I just have to mention, and I, I did a bad job of, of talking about my collaborators as I went through. So it, it's very important to mention here that these, these papers um, are, are the result of a collaboration, especially with my, my, uh, the, the members of my lab at the Academy of Natural Sciences Museum here in Philadelphia. And that's Ted Deschler, who's curator of the department, Ned Gilmore, who's our collections manager, Fred Mullison, who's our fossil preparator, 
and uh, Kelly Rosanitas, who's our curatorial assistant. And the manuscripts that I've been describing here in this talk had additional authors beyond myself and, and Ted Deschler. Uh, and those include Valentina Garcia, Nate Long, Emily Carey, all of which were undergraduates at the time that they participated in, in building these manuscripts, and also uh, Neil Shubin at the University of Chicago. So thanks everyone for listening and feel free now to come off of mute. We've got certainly time to ask questions if there are any. Uh, I had a quick question. The yeah. difference between the radiata and the other species that you found, uh, what, what selective pressure do you think would cause that difference between the two species? I mean, it was just their bone development, right? That caused the radiata pattern. Yeah, it's, it's a really good question, Samantha. And, <clears throat> um, this is this is always something that is a bit puzzling when you find very close relatives together at a single site, right? Because, like you suggest, um, there that, that that there there seems to be some interesting evolutionary story there. Because if you have one species occupying a particular niche, so one Asterolepis species doing its bottom dwelling thing in these waters, what could motivate the 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 um, the uh, the success of another species who is attempting to do the same thing in the same space. So uh, again, like the the why of it or the how of it is something that would be really difficult to chase down. But it you know it could be that um, the these these two species speciated elsewhere and then and then uh, sort of both invaded this particular space or or maybe one was successful in a particular space and the other one came in and was able to differentiate their niches just enough so that they could you know uh, exist in sort of a coincident space um, but yeah I, I think that's always something interesting to address another thing that that um, that comes up when I show this same thing to people. And, and uh, again, it, just to demonstrate that, that is a, it is a very good question, um, is I, I've got the question, is it possible that your two shapes, your two morphs are males and females of the same species, right? So it's like you've, you've got these two Astrolepis, one of them has a crest and is bigger bodied than the other, which is uncrested and smaller. Like, could that be the males and females? So, um, the, the, you know, when it comes to um, shape-based taxonomy, right, morphological taxonomy, paleo taxonomy, um, even if they are males and females of the same biological species, the, the correct thing is really to give them different names because the, the name in paleontology is referring to a particular shape, right? So it, it's, if they're shaped differently, they get different names. So Bothrelepis radiata could be the, the females of Astrolepis alticristata if we were talking about a biological species, right? So, so that's just another thing to think about that um, the, the, the questions that could lie behind what certainly seems curious um, are, 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 are not obvious from the very simple process that we do where it's like, I see a new shape, I give it a new name. And I was like, that's what I do, but, but you're right to think that there could be much more behind it. Yeah, I was also thinking like maybe, I know you said you found them in fresh water, but maybe there was like some kind of incident where, I don't know if you're close to salt water, but some kind of difference there where it kind of came over and adapted or something like that. Could be, yeah, could be. Or it, it's also possible that, you know, because we're working in these uh, stream channels and floodplains, things might, things might die and get deposited together that didn't actually live together. Right, because you've got moving water, you've got these storm systems that are raising the water up and dumping things out on the floodplain where they then die and get buried. So it's it's possible that even though we find them side by side at this particular locality, that's that's more of a uh, a product of sorting that happened after death or soon before death. So so even that can be potentially misleading. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. And I have a question. Hi, Rola. Hi. Is I, there... I owe you an email, Rola. I got to send you an email. Oh, you read it. <laughs> I did. Oh, 
Oh, it great. wasn't. Th- it wasn't that long ago, to be fair, <laughs> right? Couple days. No, it wasn't. I, I'm not. I'm not too worried about it. <laughs> okay. What was your question? Um. I. So, is there a particular extant species that you can compare this one to today, like, as as closely as possible? Because you said they're like bottom feeders. And- yeah. The structure is just really odd and I had like several different animals in mind that they reminded me of but like yeah I really pinpoint a direct like you know what I mean like group I can yeah think about. sure yeah <clears throat> I mean and it's a and it's a good question and it's um and I should note that you know Antiarchy um is entirely extinct so so if if we're thinking like are you know are there members of this group that maybe look very different today and we just we call them different you know we have a common name for them that doesn't help us to associate like they're entirely extinct so um yeah so i the way that i the, the things that i think are most antiarch like are and i don't even know the the name for them i should look them up and and send you an email um a second email but um the the there there are these catfish that have really unusual heads in the sense that for whatever reason they don't have a lot of um like muscle and soft tissue to their heads so the the skin is stretched really tight against their skull so they have this very sort of armored look to their head i should show them to you but just in terms of their their shape and also their lifestyle being being these these bottom dwellers with relatively simple ventral mouths kind of sucking up the muck on the bottom flat bottomed um they have they have a similar appearance to that but catfish are you know teleos actinotorygians like like super high advanced ray fin fish nothing to do with with um these these armored aquatic forms but just in terms of like you say it's kind of an an analogous form and an an analogous lifestyle okay cool and are those um catfish freshwater specific yep yep yeah, the cat, the catfish that I'm thinking of. Yeah, and back when I was, when I was a, when I was a grad student, we even had these kinds of catfish in an aquarium in the lab, just because we thought they looked like antiarchs. Like that's the only reason we were raising them because oh, we thought awesome. that we were thought they were we thought they were cool, and they don't get very big. They're kind of small cool. catfish. Yeah. Thanks, Rola. No problem. Thank you. Sure. First thing I think of is like a pleco, you know, like a pleco plecostomus. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you muted yourself, Sam. Back. Those are okay. the um, actinotergii, though. I think in the in that class, but yeah, it yeah. looks so really similar. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Any other questions? <clears throat> no. Hi, Jason. How are you? I'm good. It's hi. Good. How are you, Cynthia? <laughs> Sorry, I was late. I went to get a haircut today. No worries. No worries. Um, it's Looks very good. interesting that you can go to this, you know, remote, fascinating place for your job. Yeah. The pictures. Oh, that was interesting. You know, the pictures in the beginning, right? Or yeah. No. Through the, I came in at like three fifteen. So yeah. You're very lucky that you get to do something like that with your job. You know, microbiology. You're just really in the lab. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it. I mean, it's it's funny you mention that because there was there was a time. I mean, I I told my first grade teacher that I wanted to be a paleontologist. You know, it was like this. Like I had this in mind for a really long time, and when I was a little kid, my understanding of paleontology as a job was just the traveling around the world and digging up bones. You know, it was like and and specifically dinosaur bones. Like that was all it was to me. So it wasn't until um, I got an internship at the museum when I could actually start to understand it as a science and, and realize, you know, these guys only are, spend four weeks out of the year and maybe less than that, you know, in the field and the rest of the time they're in a lab or behind a computer. So, so yeah, it's, it's, it's fun to put together a presentation like this that really shows off the, the most exotic, most wonderful aspects of the science, but right, uh, right. You know, the rest of the time I'm in a lab or office also. <laughs> <laughs> All right. but yeah, no, and, and I wanted, and I, I w- you know, I, and I wanted that, that to be part of this talk to kind of just show off the, you know, some pretty pictures from the Arctic. Yeah. Right, right. That's yeah. nice. Thank you. I just have a random question about the plants. It, it seems like you're in a totally new place now, Rula. 
I keep moving because the sun, okay. and the bugs, uh, yeah. Um, okay. But uh, did you just out of curiosity, did you come across any invasive plants in that spot? Um, that you know of? I if not? wouldn't know. I mean, like I wouldn't know if I were to have seen them, but but I. I don't think the ones I showed you, any of those are are invasive. Although I, I don't I don't know the history for sure. But there's there's so little human activity in the area that comes and goes from the area that it would be it would be surprising if invasives have too much of a presence there. But but again, I don't know that I don't know the history of these plants well enough. Yeah, that's why that's why I was wondering because um, compared to here, this is all new to me. I've been in this like. Um, invasive species kick where I'm trying to like increase the biodiversity in my backyard and nice. like I'm trying to like encourage everybody to like do the same for the insects the larvae and the birds and whatnot so um yeah we do have like we have like a ton of invasive species here that I didn't even think like I just thought you know it's just a flower but they're like all over the place and they're displacing our natives that's causing yeah. a huge like disruption in the ecosystem so I was wondering because there's like it's in the arctic I wouldn't imagine that there would be as many but if there were that'd be pretty interesting yeah yeah no it it, it is interesting to me as well I, yeah, I just don't know enough about it to speak well about okay it. did you appreciate the bird images though or at least oh, the bird 100%. and the eggs I oh, figured you yeah, I figured you'd like that. Yeah, those are cool. <laughs> Good. I went I went shore bird watching too at the bay down towards the like the Delaware Bay area and I was able I went like a red knot uh I was doing a red knot count and um hmm. I was able to count up to like 100 or something like that cuz they're not that many and then you have to like read their little tags and like find the numbers on them and stuff like that. Wow. But yeah. Cool cuz I did see the semi-palmated pipers as well so when I saw that image I'm just like wow there's Yeah out there too like that's really neat nice good yeah so yeah. that was cool great thanks Rola. Mm -hmm. any other questions hey jason it's melissa hi melissa um if you're comfortable since there's yes. a number of students yep. present today would could you talk about some of the research funding that helps get those expeditions to happen yeah yeah um <laughs> So you mean like specifically for our trip? Um, for our or trips? just in, in general? I mean, I think even just some general, when you hear a student say, I'd like to do some research and you know, at Del Val, it's really small scale, but when you're looking at like a graduate level or beyond, yeah, sure. what does that mean in terms of funding? Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a good question. And let me go back, um, I'll go back to the slides here. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so I, I I didn't talk specifically, but but it's it you know it's an it's certainly an important thing and and is a is a key part of these acknowledgement slides. Um, how we're how we're able to support this work. So when we go to the Canadian Arctic, when we go to Ellesmere Island, the cost of those expeditions is twenty thousand dollars per person, and that covers um, uh, it's mostly transportation. Uh, the the cost of the helicopter rides into and out of these valleys is extremely expensive, but it's also all the airfare to get ourselves as close as we do to the valleys before the helicopters, uh, and then also all the food and the tools and, and, and everything along with it. So you can see that um, our institutions contributed to these expeditions. We also have two very uh, generous anonymous, donor, uh, anonymous donors, one of which is uh, even more, far more um, uh, generous than the other. Uh, she is actually uh, an heir to uh, part of the uh, Microsoft fortune. Um, and, and so those kinds of personal connections are, are really helpful and, and you can't not feel lucky to make some of those connections and, and find donors willing to support your work in that way. But also importantly, the National Geographic Society and the National Science Foundation uh, provided a number of different uh, grants in support of this work. You can see there's seven of them that I have listed here on this slide. Um, but as you as you move, um, especially into 
um, graduate work, and there are even small grants that are available for undergraduates, um, the more you're able to support your own work, the more attractive you become as a candidate for whatever it is that you're that you're trying to go after. So I, I ended up uh, getting into my PhD program without ever having thought of any of this. Uh, and it's just a product of, of, you know, the training that I had as an undergraduate. But as soon as I arrived in my PhD program, my, my new PhD advisor said, you're going to take your first few months here and you're going to apply for an NSF graduate research fellowship. Now, that's not something that you have to do coincident with starting a, a graduate program. It could come in advance of being accepted in a graduate program. And if you were to get such a thing, you can basically go wherever you want because you'd be funding yourself for some some uh, length of time. And the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship, at least at the time that I applied for it, uh, would was would fully fund me as a student for three full years. So my program then and my university would only have to worry about me for the other two years. So I was when I, I, I ended up getting it, but I was celebrated like you wouldn't imagine. And I and, and like I say, I think that to be thinking of those things in advance of graduate school um, is even I think if you have an active application, even if you haven't yet got an NSF grant, if you've simply submitted for one, I think even that demonstrates an initiative that would be very attractive to to graduate programs. Um, so so yeah, and then and then throughout graduate school, part of my time was always applying for small grants to support the work that I do, and the more you can find your own money and support your own work, the less beholden you have to be to others that would expect you to do what they want you to do uh, in order in exchange for that type of support. So because I supported myself for three years off of NSF, my university never asked me to do any um, research assistantships, lab assistantships, teaching assistantships for all of that three years. So again, it's it can it's it's not only a way to make yourself uh, a, an attractive candidate, but it can also free yourself up to do exactly what you want and not spend your time doing things that you don't want in exchange for um, the that kind of support. So I, yeah, I don't know if 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 that's especially helpful, um, if that's what you're thinking, Melissa. But um, it yeah. was, yeah, Good. it was, and I think that's helpful for the students to hear and get the wheels turning, right? Of what yeah. some possibilities are. Yeah. So thank you, and thank you again for another great talk. Oh, thank you, Melissa. And uh, and if anyone wants to ever talk about uh, graduate school and talk about these kinds of funding opportunities, uh, reach out to me. We could even over the summer. Uh, or beyond Zoom call and, and have a conversation about it. <clears throat> so thank you everyone for coming this afternoon. Always fun talking to you. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye, John.